industry living in your aquarium. How is it going? How's everybody doing today? We doing good? We happy? We healthy? We, uh, we eating our share of blood worms for the day? Who's in here early? And who's here late? Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, Peplin, David, what is going on? Uh, let's see here. Meridial, Muppet. Um, we've got Kevin in here, of course. Uh, Patio, six. And uh, K-Day, welcome again. we got two in a row. Folks joining me two days in a row for the surprise stream and today's. Uh, and, uh, let's see here, um, how's everybody feeling? How, how's everybody doing? Um, yeah, if I don't show up within 30 minutes of my weekly slotted time, which is usually 4.07 or 4.09, I like to just have a quirky number so that it sticks in people's minds, and then I'm usually, I'll usually be there within five minutes of that, um, depending on when other people's streams are ending because there's so many streams these days which is lovely and a bit frustrating at the same time i mean i'm happy there's so much info out there um and i'm glad there's community but it just gets hard to schedule um so how is everybody doing uh now that we're settled i know i've asked that a couple times but i have some new fish uh that i got locally uh i just couldn't help myself after recent videos on the channel uh reading about ancient egypt and the mormorids the electrical fish uh i just i had to get some and then i just miss my angels so much that i had to get some of those and um also i'm ordering uh probably a couple hundred dollars worth of really I guess I'm not a master breeder anymore. Uh, I'm also uh, ordering a couple hundred dollars worth of outdoor fish for um, tubs, which we'll be setting up in the next, I mean, over the course of the next month, we'll have everything out there. Seattle being kind of as cold as it gets. I mean, like Montana, Denver, Minnesota, you guys get cold too, but you also get even hotter in the summer than we get here. Um, so it's kind of an extreme swing, whereas here... Um, it's kind of like a gradual thing. Uh, but right now, it's it's good 75 degrees or so outside and sunny. Um, if you guys have a question, uh, please just say, at the secret history living in your aquarium, and then I'll see it. Uh, also, if you're a channel member, then you're already highlighted longer in top chat, so I can keep track of things. Um, and... Uh, also, uh, mods will be posting links and stuff as they always do because they're amazing and I love them and I want to thank them before we get going. Um, summer tubs are really cool. Uh, they are getting more and more popular every year. Um, you know, Rachel O'Leary has a good series on them. Corey from Aquarium Co-op from about five years ago has some good stuff on them. His more recent stuff is a little bit more... Um, high end like you need a little bit of money to do it like using an old jacuzzi or using um 150 gallon drinking water totes and things like that um which is really cool and i'd love to do that it's just um i think we'll probably be doing it more on the cheap you know like the rubber made totes that are out there now and uh hopefully i'd like to show you guys you know that uh the way i've done it historically uh, it's it's worked out I, i've still gotten fish uh a net gain in fish by the end of the season. Uh, it kind of depends on um, eagles and blue herrings and all that stuff and then how much you want to lock everything down versus how much you just want a tranquil little pond or, or a body of water. I think I'm going to get some old wine or whiskey barrel type things and fill those with water, let them sit for a couple weeks and then uh, yeah. Let's see here. Secret history in your aquarium. It's not Pat. It's T-Bone. Oh, what's up, T-Bone? Uh, using your lady's phone. Ah, got it, got it. So, it's T-Bone. Well, uh, I won't tell if, if, if no one else does. Uh, cheers, if, you're, if you've got a cool beverage. Okay, so you can see the condensation and everything on here. It's nice and sweaty and hot in here today. Mmm! So today, what we're going to talk about is when you buy fish, um, 
Isabel, hello, my dear. So good to see you. Always, you always brighten my day. You and Mary, I don't know why. No offense to all y'all other mongrels out there. But no, um, when you guys are in the stream, it just a smile comes to my face automatically. Y'all are so sweet and uh, always ask interesting questions and are so supportive. Um, so, we're, so everyone is just everyone is just as uniquely special as everybody else, except for those who are more uniquely special. Um, so I guess I'll show you guys what the fish we have. Um, but uh, you know, we'll talk about today loosely. If you have questions, if I mean, you could have an issue with your filtration. You could have. Um, a question about what what to put in your aquarium or whatever and I'm happy to answer those kinds of questions um, also just because this is about you guys you know the video uploads those are obviously exactly what I want to talk about you guys don't get to join in but while we have the ability for me to read your chat and you guys to join in um, these are for you and so as much as I can I'll try to uh, answer questions unless I'm really on a roll and then pardon me, ask again if I missed it for some reason. Emily, welcome. Alishan, welcome. Uh, good to see you. Alishan said, what fish are you putting outside this summer? I will try an African banded, uh, African banded barbs and lake inlay loaches. So the lake inlay species are excellent. Uh, I don't know where you, I forget where you live, but they're excellent even like here in Seattle. They work very well. Um, Lake Inlay gets some kind of colder water. It's at elevation a bit higher than a lot of Myanmar. And it's also in kind of a funky valley. Um, so while it is still tropical, it has almost a temperate into tropical um, feel to it. And then when the rain season happens, um, you get a lot of overcast days that kind of um, trap high humidity, but not necessarily sweltering heat. I don't know why things are falling in my fish room. Well, it could be the fan, I suppose. But all of a sudden, things are just falling. Like, a net just fell, and fish food fell, and then my breeder, my Grandmaster Breeder Certificate fell. Just bizarre. Um, WTF Miss MRB, uh, welcome as well. Uh, too Cooley for Schooly, welcome. Aim Spirit Fish. We got all sorts of great people rolling in. Um, so yeah, the main thing that I was wanting to talk about today is what you do when you buy a fish. So, I mean, what's the process you guys go through? I generally, um, I generally look up the fish's information and I'll look at um, fish base, um, practical fish keeping, um, if it's a native fish, I definitely look at the North American Native Fish Association information. It's great. Um, and then uh, beyond that, you know, I'll do a Google search. Aquatic Arts does really good write-ups in their description, and I'm going to be helping them with that um, from here out because when we order something that I've asked for, for instance, like there's some new, um, they're called Annie's Stiphodons, uh, and they are just these beautiful metallic, subtly uh, iridescent, rainbow-colored, pastel rainbow colors, um, Stiphodon, a small one, um, called Annie, named after a collector's wife. Um, and so stuff like that, when we, are, when, when we order it, um, we, we type up the information. So it's another good source, um, even if you're not buying something from them. That's another reason why they leave stuff when it's out of stock and sold out. Um, so the other thing uh, that I like to do is just talk to the people where you're buying the fish. So that's really important to ask them, hey, when did these fish come in? It, you know, if you know the shop gets their order on Fridays uh, and it's a new fish, then you can guess it came in on Friday. It's probably not even acclimated yet. So it's probably still within that stress window of a week or two where you can keep stressing it and it, it's either going to die or, or, or recover and flourish, um, but you're basically part of quarantine landing squad still. Whereas if it's been in a store a while or if it's locally tank raised and then brought to that store, then you can kind of assume that you need to acclimate it to your tank and um, it's going to be okay, probably similar water. Um, but you just want to double check especially with shrimp or, you know, anything that's a Lake Tanganyikan species 
or a black water species. Those are the ones where you could get yourself in trouble uh, if, you, if you put it into a low pH. But all of this is coming around to say um, that if you buy fish, it's very tempting sometimes to buy a fish. You see a fish, you love it, you're like, I need that fish. Oh, it's 40 bucks. And then you read about it and it says that ideally it's a community fish that lives with whatever, five to 20 other individuals. And then you kind of roll your eyes and bite your lip and you're like, well, how true is that? Do I really need to order, you know, do I really need to drop $500 on friends for these fish? Um, and that's what I wanted to talk about today is kind of just different fish and kind of some general rules and just my thoughts on that. I'm, I'm happy to hear your thoughts too. We got lots of experience uh, aquascapers in here and uh, yeah, <laughs> that's funny. Uh, yeah, maybe Aquarium Cop is haunting my fish room. I would welcome his haunting. I miss that guy. Uh, but yes, yeah, Sergio is probably the more likely cul culprit in my fish room. Um... <laughs> Mr. Grumby says, I like the hippie look you've been putting off. Uh, you know, actually, quite to the contrary, it's just that the last six months or lockdown, so to speak, I hadn't been putting off the hippie vibe. But if you look at my videos four or five years ago, anything in my life from 15 years ago on till recently, um, this is pretty uh, par for the course uh, in an outfit, essentially. The hair is getting long, um, but... I decided I wasn't going to cut it until we're done like with lockdown and masks and all that stuff. Although now I'm kind of digging it. It is a little hot though. Um, but let's see here. Uh, Kelly D, welcome. Uh, Tennessee Aqua, good to see you, brother. Uh, Scott's Aquatics, good to see you too. Um, we got a question um, from T-Bone, uh, down under, uh, about how do you acclimate fish? So that's a good question. and. Let's take a look right now because I have something I want to show you. This was one of those, um, one of those uh, painstaking decisions I had to make, and I lucked out by talking to the owner of the local shop. So, uh, this is a mormorid. If you saw my recent species on Egyptian ancient fish keeping. You know that they recently found uh, archaeological information on these fish that they were being kept as pets uh, or as at least as religious um, tokens in, in probably bowls, maybe vases and things, but probably ponds and, and large um, bowls or display containers with plants and, and rocks. And, um, you know, they also grew things like uh, Nymphaea micrantha and other um, Nymphaea crulensis, uh, which they believe had psychoactive properties or spiritual properties. So when they were growing lotuses and water lilies, it totally makes sense that they may have uh, used these fish uh, as as something to be in the ponds. Uh, these are native to the Nile, uh, the white, the blue, and the main Nile. These guys are found a little farther south. These are the Peterson uh, Petersoni. Or, or, or wait, no, Peter's eye, Peter, Peter's eye, um, not Peter's son eye, Peter's eye. Um, and you can see here, this one's a little bit more of a baby, uh, but they are real cute fish. Um, but these are a fish that you either are supposed to have one of or about a dozen or more. And the reason for that is they communicate through electronic signals. Uh, they send out uh, little uh, high frequency waves. And actually this whole part of their caudal peduncle is a battery essentially. There are muscles that wrap around it like a coil, just like a copper coil uh, on, a, on like an old um, acidic battery, you know, um, like uh, what are those called? The Leiden jars. And these guys also, they need live food, they need, um, they need a substrate like sand or silt or mulm that they can dig through to eat, and they've got these little elephant noses, um, but because of the little elephant noses, they also, you also, you can't have, 
uh, rough gravel or like lava rock, they'll hurt themselves. And um, like I said, this whole part of their caudal peduncle it, or tail, like the meaty part of the tail before the fins, uh, is a battery, essentially. So it discharges off, and then there are sensors all around the outside rim, up on the spine or the hump of the fish, and then um, down below as well. And then there's another organ, too, that uh, does something else. They don't exactly know what yet, but they can... They can image it with, um, you know, high-tech equipment, and they find that that is where the electric activity is emanating from. So, right now, this poor guy is really stressed because the electricity is in that bag, and it's probably trying to echolocate, and it just it doesn't know what is going on. It, it, it's bouncing off. And they use this to see in the really muddy, uh, murky waters, like, you know, in the Mississippi River, how it's like mud. This the Nile gets the same way during the wet season. And so you can see that nose, like the little dolphin nose or elephant nose. It actually, they can use it like a little appendage, but it senses a lot, as with the tail. So when I'm acclimating these fish, these guys need to be acclimated several ways. Um, they're not going to put off enough, like, enough electricity that like they're going to hurt you like uh, an electric eel would. Um, they're more like a ghost knife fish. Um, and these are in the Mormorid family, as I said. Uh, Mormorid um, Petersi. And um, they need to eat um, Daphnia or um, Artema or... Um, I guess any sort of uh, plankton that's zooplankton, um, they are predominantly insectivores or benthic uh, crustacean eaters, uh, but I've never kept this species, so I'm excited. Um, I'm hoping that they're, they're going to like this tank. Um, I, I kind of want to get some more plants in this tank, but at the same time, they're not big. On, they don't need a ton of plants, but these are one, like I said, um, that they're supposed to be either one or a bunch of them because now they're thinking that the electric signals that they put out mess with one another and they kind of tell each other like hey this is my area or this is my region of the tank don't bug me and they need about a square foot or so ideally however these two were in a tank together with some other fish and they have been hanging out just by default at the pet store for about three weeks and they have been getting along so I happened to buy them both now they were kind of expensive um, you know they when all was said and done I think I spent almost 80 bucks on them but um, they're really cool fish and uh, these ones are wild caught and uh, in fact we don't really know much about breeding them in captivity they get caught at a really small size frequently, but these ones are pretty good size to, to medium. But to acclimate them, what I'll be doing, I don't use like the drip system that everyone all uses that you might be familiar with necessarily. The The method I like is what I'll do is I'll, I'll put the bag upright, I'll clip it onto something like the light or the rim, and then what I'll do is I will either open the bag or I will poke a hole or cut a hole in it and I will start taking water from the tank and just simply after it's at temperature for a half hour or so, I'll dump in, say, half a cup of water into the bag. Or at first, you know, maybe I'll even start with a teaspoon or two uh, and wait five minutes, then then do, you know, half a cup or whatever. Make sure that they're doing okay uh, before we get the rest going. You can see there's Mises shrimp in here that it didn't eat that got scooped into the bag too with it. Or it could have thrown up some of them too, I'm not sure. But, um, so what I do is that, and then usually by that point, the bag's pretty full of water. And so then what I'll do is I'll, uh, squeeze out some water and then refill it again. And that gets out, um, usually then it's kind of half and half new and old water. And just depending on the species, the pace that I do that, it, it's, it's the same thing as drip acclimation for the most part. I mean... You, it's a little more of a step process, but if something starts going wrong, then you can always back off and say, oh, you know what, 
I think that that, that water is not working out for them. They're losing their color or whatnot. But it's also important, too, to know, do they like bright light? Do they not like bright light? What kind of, um, you know, the acidic, basic, what kind of water? These ones were in totally neutral water, and that is where they're going into is pretty neutral water also. So they should be okay. Um, as for fish going into like this acidic tank, I got a couple angels. It's no Sergio, but these guys were on sale, so I decided I'd get them. They're just black angels. They're, um, they're very young and they're locally bred and they were just a good price, so I got two of them. Um, they're kind of beaten up on each other in the bag a little bit, so I do want to get them out of here. But, uh, another fish that that it's a very valid question of, um, you know, how, what, hmm, how do, how do we word this? What sort of size population do you need for these fish to thrive? So for angels, you know, when they're young, I, typically, I, if you don't already have some angels, I usually recommend people buy six. And this is true for anything that pairs off, like cichlids and things. Ideally, buy six to eight of them if you can afford it, you know? Same with young epistogrammas, same with um, crebenzis, whatever it may be. Um, same with... Uh, I guess, uh, you know, uh, blue rams. Any of those fish that pair off uh, for life or pair off long term, you know, and then spawn. Uh, plecos, that's another one that they'll pair off in caves. Um, I highly recommend getting six. If you get six, you have a 94% chance, assuming that the species is 50-50 male-female, Actually, most species are 51% female and 49% male. Humans are too. Most fish are. It's kind of an odd thing. Um, but it just kind of seems to work out to be the rule for some reason. Um, but, like, the same with the plecos. When they're young and not, not super... Um, like this guy. This would be a great size to get, like, six of them. Then afterwards, you can sell them. You've grown them out. They're bigger or you can sex them and whatnot, but that way it allows them to pair off naturally. If you get six, seven, eight of something, they'll, they'll find their mate and they'll pair off naturally, which is so much better than when you just try to get a male and female and just you, you kind of hang on by the seat of your pants hoping that it's gonna work out and you have no idea if it'll actually work out. Um, also, whoops, you know, I just noticed something that's going on in this tank and it's going to throw off my plan to put those angels in here. These angels are not going in here anymore because I moved this angel. And if you recall, Sergio had a rough time. He got, um, Sergio got jumped out of the tank and this angel suffered a lot of stress too. Well, I moved it in here a while ago, and now you know what I see? These fish are five years old. These lemon tetras with the orange eyes, they've got some sort of either ick or velvet I just am seeing now. And they didn't last night. So this is a very sudden thing. Um, so what I'm going to do, I'm not stressed about it. I'm not freaking out. I did a big water change by chance last night. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at the heater. And we're going to change the heat. Right now it's at 79. So what we're going to do is we're going to crank the heat up to 86 in here. And everybody who's in here should be able to handle it. Uh, let us let me set this down so I can do that real quick. And then I'll take a look at your comments too. And make sure nobody's done any super chats or members have joined. I always feel awful when I miss that stuff. Hold on. So let me set this down for one moment. And then we'll keep talking about this whole how many of a certain fish do I need type thing. Okay. So we're going to crank this up. And do, 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 do. It is right now. Oh, it's, it's low. So we're going to crank this up to 86. And that gives us 84.7 or so 
is really the uh, sweet spot to treat ick. But not just ick, it actually treats a lot of medic, a lot of uh, parasites. Um, for some reason, the, around that temperature is one they don't like. And this, to me, doesn't look necessarily like ick. Uh, it looks more like a velvet or something uh, to me. It's, it's all over and very, very, very tiny dots. Um, so we'll see. Um, we'll see what's going on with that. Uh, but let's see here. Let me get back down. Uh, oh, I see another question. Do you quarantine? Um, you know, I, I should quarantine more, um, but I don't always quarantine. Anything from aquatic arts, I don't quarantine just because I personally trust them. That doesn't mean uh, that that's what I think anyone else should or shouldn't do. But um, for me, I'm comfortable with that. I've never had a problem from their fish. I've had my fish give their fish problems. Uh, but like right now, I think we're, we're going to use this tank up here instead. But just because it was in that tank's water, even for a moment, we're going to go in here and just rinse it off. Just this, you know, dunk of rinsing it off in chlorinated water should help get the ick off. Ick or velvet or whatever it is, um, it should. We could put it in another bag. That'd be the safest thing to do. But um, coincidentally, I'm almost positive that, that that tank and the other tank both, as you know, I've had um, some parasites doing the rounds um, in these tanks. So I've had whatever it is, ick or velvet, doing the rounds in, in, it was in this tank for a while, and then it was in this tank for a while. And now it's here. Uh, oh, and it was in this tank. And these guys, they've been at 86 for a few days. And look how good they're doing. I mean, I know there's algae in the way. But these gouramis were covered in that too. And they're completely back to normal almost. Almost. But the thing is, now we have to make sure that the eggs don't come back. And the way we do that is uh, we leave the heater in there. And uh, two weeks. Two weeks will make sure that everything's dead. Look at all the shrimp eating these. They're, what they're eating right here is the uh, sinking wafers from Aquatic Arts. Uh, there are just so many. And there are cichlids, like, right in here, sleeping or whatever, hanging out. And also these. If you guys watched yesterday's surprise stream, th they ate them. They're, they got eaten yesterday, uh, and nobody seems to care. Everybody's just chilling, doing their thing. Um... Daniel, uh, oh wait, no, David Meter, welcome so much. Thank you so much for joining the channel. I really do appreciate that. As you know, um, I'm trying to do this as my primary grind now, and I want to give you guys as much content, information, and feedback as possible. If I'm ever not getting back to you guys, you know, let me know. Say, hey, I asked a question and I still haven't heard back. Um, because I really try to answer questions, even if you're not a member or anything. Uh, but for those of you who are members, uh, it's kind of like, uh, if you like Channel 9, I don't have the best perks in the world to offer, uh, unless you're entertained, which I hope you are, uh, that's kind of a perk. But, uh, and I do giveaways, and I get discount codes to pass on, but, but I, I, you don't need to pay anything for those. So it's more if you appreciate this and you want to see me doing more of this, more of the research-heavy videos like the one on ancient Egypt and those fish, um, the mormorids and um, how they were kept and the new archaeology, like fish news you can't use, um, the nerdy stuff, you know? Um, also, some kind of exciting news is Joey from King of DIY. I'm going to be talking to him and interviewing him about the notion of the change of the internet and uh, YouTube and self-publishing books, like on-demand publishing, which he did with his um, how to build like plywood uh, aquariums and things. His, his like 700-page manifesto of how to basically on the cheap and at home build stuff um, for your aquarium. So. Uh, I'm going to talk to him, and we're going to kind of have him as, uh, you know, we did Rachel O'Leary's interview not too long ago, but uh, I got a hold of him this morning, finally, and we have that, uh, that uh, you know, 
interesting thing coming up. So, uh, Aim Spirits Fest says uh, the more Mormers give off uh, 25 volts. Its discharge can be felt by touching the caudal peduncle when the fish is taken out of the water. Yeah, it's it's pretty subtle, but you definitely I, I've read that you can um, you can definitely feel it. How many dwarf neon rainbows should I have for my colony? I have 12 currently. That's plenty. So, you know, honestly, dwarf... Oh, I didn't even turn this around. Hold on. Dwarf neon rainbows, Praycox uh, rainbows. Here, these guys. Uh, here's a yellow... See the yellow fin? Female. Red. Male. Um, in here, I've got six. They're in with the pea puffers. I've never tried this combo before. But so far, everybody seems to be vibing and getting along fine. I think they're big enough and um, quick enough and hold their ground enough. And they don't really have fins that are super long. Um, I see one nipped fin on, on one fish. Uh, and that happened the first day that I put them all together. Uh, it seems like the rainbows are chasing each other more. So that's another thing that you need to decide. When you buy new fish... Hold on, it's looking foggy in here. Uh, when you buy new fish, you need to decide what other fish are in your tank. What's in the community that could give your other fish grief? Um, and for instance, if you're going to be breeding or spawning um, fish just for profit, and it's going to be a big breeder tank, like a 40 breeder, and not a community tank with a diverse lineup of fish, then you can usually cram as many of a fish as you want if it is a community fish. Now there are some fish like um, Oscars and things like that where keeping one is totally fine. The general rule with that is they're either going to be completely predatory fish or completely algae eating fish. Um, and people don't realize it, but surprisingly to some, the autosynclus that everyone seems to keep one or two of, those actually swarm in the thousands. They school in these massive groups in the uh, Amazon and in the Orinoco. So there are a lot of fish that we don't necessarily keep in ways in which we're going to get the best behavior, the best coloration the best health and the best hierarchy or pecking order um, where they don't get harmed. Uh, that Borneo loach, yes, it's good to have a group of them, but if you don't have a group, one is good. Um, generally, unless you know that they're a fish that pairs off for breeding, um, and by pairs off I mean either has some parental care or takes care of an area, like is territorial um, while spawning, Generally, you can have one male and a female, or one male and two females. So you'd call that a trio or a pair, obviously. And that's usually fine for, for you know, a lot of cichlids, um, plecos, um, stiphodons, uh, even like rainbow fish or, uh, or um, quarry catfish or erythromicrons, anything that's going to kind of... Um, spawn tightly rather than just spawn momentarily and then split up and not be near each other. Uh, if you have something like that, like a neon tetra or something, uh, you can put them in a small tank with just, you know, three. But you always want to make sure that the females heavily outweigh the males, um, any fish that, that the males show off. So like these thread fins, uh, if the male is showing off, if the male is bright and colorful, these two males here are definitely showing off. That means that they hassle the females. So you definitely need a one-to-one -one ratio at minimum uh, of male to female, if not a two-to-one ratio of females. And here we've got three females, two males at the moment. It used to be four females. Uh, then one got sick and she's up there now. Um, but... Everybody else is doing good. All these stiphodons are doing really good. But you can see that they just chase that female down. Um, and same with the Luminatus. And the other thing that you want to think about is the fact of what are they doing. So like a stiphodon, you can actually keep just one stiphodon. But you're not going to get the cute, interesting activity. You see how like they kind of, um, they create all these burrows together and like this one's going nuts chasing after something and these guys are kind of all piled in together. You get really unique and fun behavior from these fish. 
or this schismatogobius. This is one that you don't necessarily want a big group of. You could have a, a big group, like 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 of them, that's fine. But really, you don't even want a trio of these or whatnot because they don't breed in captivity and um, they need their area. So same with like Scarlet Battis. That's one where you can easily have one male and just leave him alone. However, he's not going to show his best colors. So usually, again, if you've got a predatory fish and it's not extremely predatory like a, a full-grown Oscar or a Green Terror, Red Devil or... Uh, Haitiensis or you know something like that where they literally will kill each other um, I recommend getting pairs or trios for pretty much every species if you want to breed it if it's an algae eater usually they can graze like an autosynclus you've probably all seen them alone in tanks and they can graze they're okay but you get this really cool like here, you can see we've got a female who's got eggs in her belly up, up at the top of this. And another um, subdominant female next to her. we got another female back there with a, a full b a belly full of eggs. See them? You can actually see the dark spot. And then we've got all the males down below um, hanging out down here. And they've been showing off. There's another male up here showing off. And they're all just grazing on microfilm, uh, biofilm, and algae right now. So over here we've got the gold neon uh, stiphodons. And again, those rainbow are showing off. And not that these are at all violent fish, um, the thread fins. It's just they can tire out and stress out the females. If, if you had like five males and two females, they can literally stress them to death. And then you're left with males, and then the males just fight, and pretty soon you don't have any fish. So, not the best situation. All right, so there's a super chat that I definitely missed. I'm going too slow through you guys. Um, I don't, um, uh, Kevin, I don't pre-treat when I quarantine. I think that we over-treat our fish. The only time... I actually treat my fish is if they're in a tank, like a quarantine tank, like one of the ones up here or over there, uh, and I notice there's a problem. If there's ick or velvet, boy, look at the eggs on her. It's too bad that she needs salt water to spawn. Otherwise, she would have so many babies, this gal. Um, just beautiful. And she's just a character. But these stiphodons... Um, that all hang out, they're different species even. So that's, that's another thing. If you've got tetras that are in the same class or in the same subgroup of species, oftentimes they'll hang out together and um, school together, they're shoal together. That little, that little goby and this red uh, twig uh, catfish, they're kind of, they can, they could take it or leave it. Now they do live in, um, in social groups in the wild they live in big groups but here they they graze on algae all day and unless they're spawning which I, I have not really intentionally gotten the red catfish or any farowellas or any of the banjo catfish or anything any of the oddball catfish that are kind of small and like this the long skinny ones I haven't ever really gotten them to spawn I haven't attempted it yet um, although I would like to and same with uh, these gobies over here. We've got two different species that are from a little bit of cooler water. And in this tank here, um, a lot less socializing is going on. They're mostly just kind of eating and grazing. And they're pretty. They're fun to look at. You can get a good picture of them. But there's not the... Um, the, the the excitement that's going on over here. I mean, look at these guys. They're just all over. They're swimming mid-water. They're moving around. They're coloring up because you've got both genders, two different, uh, well, three different species. We've got the big fat female here full of eggs and the male from the other species. So this is a Cerufus goby, um, also known as the birdsong um, goby. And then we've got two. We've got the neon blue, and then we've got the neon... Uh, yellow, or sometimes it's called black and yellow, or golden yellow, um, typhodon. And then there's actually two cobalt blues in here too, but there's the male, uh, Cerufus. 
also known as birdsong gobies. And these guys, like I said, they're totally peaceful. They don't even have um, teeth that could bite. They don't even have mouth parts that could hurt other fish. So it's just a matter of how happy do you want your fish, you know? And, and so say you have like live bears or guppies or something like that. They can definitely, you could have a group of them, obviously. Um, whoa, look at them going nuts. That, the, the little micro dragon just went over to the birdsong goby and just like spazzed out. I don't know if he was chasing a little, little um, copepod of some sort or what. Um, but yeah, so like when you've got a small fish, like um, for instance, I got some sword tails and we've got endlers here, we've got guppies up here. Those are definitely community fish, but they don't need a community. So you can keep one male endler. Um, but again, don't keep five males and one female because in almost every case in, in, in uh, most species, it's the males that will end up just grinding down the stamina of the female, stressing them out, uh, you lose the female, and then you just kind of lose the whole project. But that's for, for fish where it's real obvious, where the sexual dimorphism is very clear. Um, and, and that helps because you know um, the males and females look different. As a general rule, when you can't tell what gender they are, most people just keep uh, a selection of fish. So again, like these guys are going to go out into the tub um, in the yard soon, but these are just little meteor minnows, white cloud minnows, um, uh, and they're just going to go out and be happy as little clams. Um, I've got a yellow fin and a red fin variety in here, and it's you can sex them for sure uh, at this age. By this age, you can tell by the belly and a little bit by the intensity of the color. Like that's a female there. Uh, probably a male there, female, see that belly, and then probably male with, see the finnage being so, there's yellow finnage and red finnage and then white tips on it. It's a very lovely looking um, meteor minnow or white cloud minnow, Tan, tans uh, minnow is also another name for them. Um, but yeah, with those, I always recommend getting six, bare minimum, uh, just get six. And if you can't, then don't have them. Uh, same with Celestial Pearl Daniels. I mean, in theory, if you have a two gallon tank, yes, you could get three of them. I'd get two females and a male if you can. If you can't assure that, then I just wouldn't do it. Um, I'd get something else like a Phoenix Rasbora, and then I'd get seven or eight of those could go in a two and a half gallon. I'm not kidding, they're so small. In here we've got least killifish. Um, you can tell the genders on them, uh, but not, not much of a worry, they're a colony breeder. So when you read that a fish is a colony breeder, um, I mean, it kind of is what it sounds like. You don't need to worry about it. They're gonna breed as a colony, like guppies, like all live bears, pretty much. And, um, you know, same with these little panda loaches. These guys, um, I have nine of. I started with 12 two years ago. Um, a few died right off the bat, and the rest have all been healthy and happy since. Um, but, yeah, that's kind of how it goes. And even with my new cichlids, which are turning out to be quite violent, uh, they're quite territorial, um, these guys, we've got eight of them. And I wouldn't have accepted them unless I had at least five or six of them. And with quarries, I almost always try to have five or six quarries, too. Uh, for the same reasons that I've listed. Um, and these guys uh, definitely wiped out all the tetras in the tank that were left that were hiding that I couldn't catch. And they wiped out... Um, so they wiped out three reed tetras and two glow light tetras. They also got an endler that I hadn't noticed until literally it made a run for it when I did a water change. It had been hiding up behind the filter and uh, made a run for it. That that caused the instinct of these haplochromis and boom, they, they went nuts and got it like a bass would. Here's a little sub-adult male. 
Um, but again, it diffuses that tension. We've got, we've got one alpha male, and then we've got the subdominant male. He knows that he's not going to take over. Same with the pea puffers. We've got a pea puffer in here. We've got six of them, and there's one that's usually right up front that's a male. He's got blue spangling on him, and if we had bright light on him, which they just don't like bright light, um, you would see that he's very yellow and green. Whereas the next most popular one, this female, uh, is is not so much that way. She's more toned down, which females are in color anyways. But then, like, say this next little male here, he has very washed out color, and it's because he's not the dominant male. He's not the... Uh, a lot of people say alpha male. Um, that's actually not a good term anymore. It's really a term from, from back when... Um, wolves were being studied in captivity in the 70s and 80s and it turns out that there's no such thing as alpha or beta males in wolf society in the wild um it was a thing that happened when they're put in cages and when they're terrified and bored um one or the other you know uh let's see here i have been neglecting the chat but i just wanted to come in here because we've got other species that we can chat about um where oh there it is kelly d a five dollar super chat coming with the laughing cute adorable little shiba inu or whatever dog that is thank you so much really really appreciate it um you know i i uh yeah thank you you're a sweetheart um not nola jane fish rich what's going on good to see you obviously good to see bob kaler um big j what's going on brother uh monster fish gal good to see that you won that big tank hank what's going on brother good to see you zen ginger um okay so it says uh, so i have seven autos in my in with my beta in a 29 gallon should i get like seven more or like 20 more also would that affect whether or not they breed or don't breed so Autos don't tend to breed in captivity, and a lot of people think it's because, oh, they're hard to breed or something. You just hit the nail on the head. It tends to be, one, either they're with fish that are going to eat their eggs, or two, there's just not a big group. And there's something about them, like salmon, where they want to get together, and they'll all kind of dog pile in a corner. And it's the same with a lot of loaches. Uh... And when egg scatterers are in the water, what they need is they actually need like rocks and gravel with big crev crevices and a good amount of flow uh, so that when they lay the eggs, they're out of sight, out of mind. Even though autosynclus aren't going to eat them, other fish will. But autosynclus are bred in captivity fairly readily. You just need a fairly good sized group. I don't know if there's a magic number. I mean, seven, That's a, you're doing a good job. Um, you know, autosynclus, like I said, you can have just one or two or three and they're okay. I've got three in this tank because it's a 17 gallon and, uh, honestly they would just be out of food and I'd only have autosynclus in here when I want to have gobies and pencil fish and, um, you know, I'm just greedy really. Uh, but it's, it's, um, it's a matter of preference too i mean a lot of people just don't think they're cool enough or pretty enough to be the feature fit of the tank and when you have 20 of them they quickly become the feature fish uh but you know sparkling garamis are another one where you get um a lot more productivity out of them if they're either in a small tank and you do a trio or you do the colony thing it's kind of an either or there's really a breaking point and the graph really is like ideal situations terrible uh to have five to ten of something uh, or i should say three to seven of something and then starting with six or seven it gets better and better and better and better um and then you know plateaus out at whatever size would just be a massive school of them um beta sororities um i think that those are fine uh rachel definitely um also, Jess, what's going on? Good to see you, my friend. Sorry to haven't woken up and gotten your, uh, in your streams lately. Yevo, good to see you, buddy. Uh, Kelly D. Um, let's see. I feel like I've not been 
paying attention to chat after I just said I was going to. Let me just make sure. Catfish Terry, what's going on, brother? Um, let's see. Um, I have a 14-gallon cube aquarium stocked with one opal betta, 10 rummy nose, and three auto cats. Do you think it's overstocked? No, but it depends on how many plants you have. If you've got it planted like these tanks, you're fine. You're totally fine. Um, if you've got a good filter on it and you're half as planted as these tanks, you're probably still fine. Just keep an eye on the nitrates, but also um, with those bettas, you're going to want regions where you've got floating or tall um, plants where they can hang out. And it's best to have, you know, some broadleaf plants that are at the water surface because bettas like to sleep on the leaves. So do pea puffers for that matter. Pea puffers actually sleep hierarchically. If you watch a, a true colony of pea puffers when I had like 10 or 12, each night they would actually find a leaf and the alpha male would pick a corner where he couldn't be surprised and um, I know I said I'm not alpha male is kind of a misnomer, but we're going to call him that or dominant male. He'd pick a corner and he'd look out and the females would be out in the open, whereas the other males would all be backed into corners or in little caves or tucked under a leaf. And they would stay there for probably four to six hours every night when it got dark. Um, and then they'd start stirring again. Uh, so, yeah. Again, uh, I started this school years ago, and it was much bigger. There's still three or four hiding elsewhere. Um, but ember tetras are another good example of one where, you know, six bare minimum to get this color. I mean, like right now on the live stream, it's not coming up very well. But if you have less than that, generally their color is awful. Generally, you can't make out even that they've got this kind of yellow and silver belly that's really beautiful. Um, or the fact that they get that kind of um, rotund belly, kind of hatchet fish shape. Uh, and they, um, they don't relax unless there's enough of them. And what they'll do is they'll shoal. So shoaling is when they're within about five body lengths to 10 body lengths of each other, whereas schooling generally is two to three body lengths away and moving as a cohesive group. That's, that's not, there's no hard and fast definition, but that's uh, generally, um, that's kind of what I've decided from the literature. I think that seems fair. Also, with like plecos like these ones, the leopard frog plecos, these are carnivorous pleco, and they can be territorial. So you want to make sure that you've got enough caves and overhangs and things for at least all your fish, and then it, some people say double. I say if you've got five fish that need caves or that like caves, then you should have seven or eight caves. So I say um, one and a half times as many fish as you have that want a cave should have a cave. So same with shell dwellers. And those, then it allows, it encourages also, you remember, if you want to spawn something or breed something, you need to not only show the fish that it has what it wants. So you're not just showing these fish that they've got what they want, like these pencil fish, you're showing them by feeding them live food, by ha them having enough room. See this female, she is ready to have babies any moment. Like she would spawn uh, if it probably, she's probably a little tense because of the um, sparkling, um, sparkling garamis and because of the tetras. But if it weren't for that, <laughs> that Beckford pencil fish, this female that's that golden color instead of the champagne and peach color like these males, she's so full of eggs um, and she's ready to go. She's that bright gold color. Um, if we had a few more fish or more room to run, we laid those eggs most likely. So letting them know that they have room for those babies to survive is important. Same thing with planaria and snails how do you get a snail explosion when you start getting all these snails like right here this is a warning sign i'm seeing like five snails that are smaller um it's okay because they're eating a carpeting section of of the the tank and i want that but um 
it's usually overfeeding. And, and why do they start doing that or, or what causes that? It's that they get this, this hormone. It's literally a hormone trigger in their body that says, there is enough food for me and maybe double or you know maybe triple me and other fish. And so once everybody's eaten, they release this um, oxytocin type hormone that is satisfying and it says i'm happy i'm satisfied they release dopamine you know their heartbeat goes uh calmer they're less skittish and they say you know what life's good i just i filled up and then uh there's still food on the ground so they're still smelling food so what happens their body says you know what you had plenty of energy so you had your fill go ahead and keep eating and then after that point it says you know what let's trigger your hormone production and so whether it's estrogen progesterone testosterone that's when the fish start getting ready to spawn they start coloring up so if you see them coloring up if you see their ovipositor um this little uh, appendage coming down from their belly um or if you see uh, the males doing dances like in guppies. Guppies will breed in a cup usually. They don't really care if there's resources at hand. But most other species other than like live bears, they want to know that they have all the food they could want and enough for their babies. And even if they're, say, garamis this big, they can see in the water, same with these cichlids, they can see... Is there tiny, are there tiny little infusoria for my babies? Because these guys have teeny tiny babies. So they need to know, you need to put in there, even if the adults aren't eating it, green water, infusoria, vinegar eels, whatever it may be, whatever the babies would eat of a species you're trying to spawn, add that to the tank once they're done eating. And it tells them, my babies can survive here because they're not going to waste the energy. They've evolved uh, a smartness, uh, so to speak, to not, why would they blow all those calories and energy and all the survival that they've been through since they were born just to have babies that don't have enough food? So there's these basic things that to us maybe don't seem like obvious or or that important. Like, I mean, it makes sense kind of, I guess, but it just doesn't seem like that's the trick, you know, um, but in many cases it is. And with the auto syncless and things like that, um, biofilm is the trick. So rotate rocks if you need to, you know, in this tank, you guys know this thing's full of stiphodons, but they all have lots of rocks with biofilm. This lights on 16 hours a day. It's not a very strong light, but it grows um, this is Marmo moss ball algae actually on manzanita and then also we've got all sorts of biofilm and algae growing on the rocks and that lets them know that their babies have food that's why their bellies are getting full likewise it's growing some free water single cell algae and that's why the thread fins are coloring up and showing off it's why these uh, Pseudomagill luminatus are growing so quickly and showing off. Um, yeah. Here's that new catfish I got, by the way. These are another one that they should either be in a big group or they should be kind of alone. And uh, I got two uh, because they happen to be able to tell male and female on them. Uh, and so just on a whim, I got two because to see. But I'm not saying that's the way to do things. Same with these garamis here. These um, chocolate or, um, well, if you were keeping chocolate, these, these are valiant or um, rainbow or samurai garamis. And you want to keep them. Oh, she's still got some. Uh, actually, that's a heat. He's still got some ick or velvet or whatever that is on the fins did you guys see that whereas the other ones are doing better now that i showed you um the darker ones are the males and yep there's that one with all the dots still on the tail and on the fins whereas the other ones are doing better so we're going to keep that heat up for another total of two weeks afterwards um so that those the eggs of whatever parasite or issue whether it's ick or velvet or whatever 
we're gonna just let the heat take care of it first. If that doesn't take care of it after two weeks, I mean, you should immediately see it stop in its tracks. It shouldn't get any worse after about 48 hours once the heat's up to 86. But beyond that, if it gets worse, then you start treating with chemicals. Then you can move things out. But if it's something like that, it's really best to treat the whole tank because at that point, the babies of the parasites are already in the little cysts or blisters on the fish. And those are actually like filled with liquid little babies or cells of protozoa or nematodes or whatever it may be of those um nasties so yeah uh let's see here uh jerry uh how many rice fish can i safely keep together in a 10 gallon before they start dying i just moved and now all my plant buckets are covered in fry oh right on that's exciting um you know i've in in um in a 10 gallon, you can fit a lot of rice fish. In this five gallon, I had at least 20 at one point. Now that being said, just check the water. They can deal with quite a bit of nitrates, honestly. They can deal with lots of heat. They can deal with lots of cold. They can deal with lots of lots of lots. Just keep them well fed um, and make sure there's lots of plants in them. Lo lots of areas for them to lay eggs too. Um, and honestly, shallow can be fine too. If 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 you want to keep them in something like a Rubbermaid tote or um, a shoebox type shaped uh, container that's not even glass, you can always do that. Some people keep them in saucers, like that you would put under a potted plant that's just only a few inches, like two inches deep. In Japan, that's a very common way to keep them. Um, but I would suggest floating plants because they are such fast growers that they're going to help keep that nitrogen and the, and the ammonia uh, down to a minimum. Also, I would say don't feed them if they're outdoors. Just let whatever's growing in the tank, be that algae, be that little mites, be that uh, daphnia or something. And it's always good to inoculate it with you know, microworms or blackworms or something, you know, that, that's food that they're going to like. Um, Daphnia, brine shrimp, things like that. Brine shrimp aren't going to live, obviously, but little critters of that sort, it's always good to do that um, because, again, you've got that diversity that you want. Just like I said that you can get fungus growing when you don't have a diversity of fungus, um, you know, that is also something to think about with bugs. You may get one monoculture of a really annoying parasite or bug, whereas if you have 20 bugs, you might have a couple bad ones, a couple good ones, and mostly, like, ones that don't matter either way. But that diversity kind of fills up all the niches of where you may have something. Now, while I'll say that the rice fish will reproduce in very small containers and things, like literally this, this gallon bowl, when I had three rice fish in it that I was just keeping separate because they were a separate strain and I was waiting to cycle a tank, I literally had them in a bowl, no filter or anything. They had babies in that bowl. So when I took them out of the bowl, put them in another tank, the babies grew out in there for, I don't know, two or three months last year. And I think there were 17 or something. By the time they were about half an inch long, I moved them. Now, granted, again, I, didn't, I wasn't feeding them constantly. It's the overfeeding that's going to kill the fish or poison the water, um, definitely. All right, let me get back to the comments. Um, all right, you have a good one, Jerry. If you're still here, have a great day. Um, would you recommend Bloody Mary shrimp or fire? I would get fire red. Bloody Marys are great, but they're from a line called the Shoko or chocolate line, and only diamond blue shrimp. Sometimes people call them blue dream or blue fantasy. Really dark shrimp and carbon shrimp and chocolate shrimp. Only those colors, so brown, black, sometimes deep blue and then deep deep red those are the only colors that come from that shoko line and so you could in theory mix any of those colors if they came from that line but blue is usually not from that line it's usually from the cherry or rusty red line the uh the sakura line and um 
then you've also got um, another species, arguably the palmata, which is where you get some yellows and things. But you can also get the yellow pigmentation within the cherry line too, the Sakura yellows. And so I would recommend not worrying about any of that, um, the stuff with the Bloody Marys, because they've got one gene for their flesh being red and one for their um, outer shell, their exoskeleton also being red, but it could also be black or it could be blue or it could be brown. And when it mixes with another, uh, another Neocaridina, it tends to revert and you end up with more just kind of clear shrimp with some hints of the colors that they used to have. So I would go with something like these, you know, a really good painted fire red. And you can get these now for like five bucks a lot of places if you buy like 10 or 12 of them. And um, they're, I mean, they're such solid red that they're as good as the reason why people were buying Bloody Marys back in the day. They're, they're that, they're just as red. Um, for a while they weren't. And that's why the Bloody Marys were so highly respected. Whereas these guys, you can mix them. Um, in theory, you don't want to mix colors, but orange, yellow, uh, blue, green, the Rillies, the blue ry Riley or blue Rilly, the clear or red Rillies, um, all those different lines um, come from basically a facet of the cherry shrimp morphs, um, the Sakura color, wild color that's red. Um, hey, Mary, good to see you. Um, Jason C., what's up? Uh... Yeah, uh, if we could hit that like button, that would be pretty cool, wouldn't it, guys? Uh, Mr. Manifesto, what's up? Um, let's see here. Freaky Fish Lady, how's it going, Holly? What's up? I recognize the picture still. Um, all my embers shoal together except one of them. It just sits in the corner and joins in every so often, especially when there's food. What's wrong? Um... It could be something as simple as the main head honcho of the group said, you're not in the club. Um, it could have gotten, you know, picked on, pecked on, and it just decided it's not worth it to go join them. Um, sometimes what you could do is you could move like three or four of the, the shoal or the group with that loner into a different tank that's smaller and see if they group up together there. If it's still hanging off on its own, it's probably sick or has something neurologically wrong with it. Um, you know, people always go to, oh, does it have X or Y communicable disease? But really, um, you have to remember, they, they have things too, like chromosome defects. They have things like, it's just, that fish is just an asshole and no one likes that ember. Um, or it, it could just be seen as weak. Maybe it has a neurological issue and it's twitching. And because it's twitching, uh, the other fish are thinking, I don't want to be near that. That a predator is going to see it. It's going to think that we're a fishing lure, you know? Um, so yeah. Um, Kelly D, could you please do a comparison of green neon tetra next to a blue tetra? I have an entire video just on that about what makes each one special and how to tell the difference um, and the cardinal tetra and the different morphs so uh i'd, I'd check out that video um it's got some good footage in it too um all right let's see here um doo -doo -doo. jason hickey what's up uh thomas v what's going on Mr. Gromby, uh, what about predatory bugs coming into the tubs outside? Some nasty ones as well. Yeah, not keeping outside tub. Um, yeah, there are some predatory bugs. The worst of them usually is dragonfly nymphs. Um, they can definitely kill a whole lot of your baby fish or shrimp in a hurry. Beyond that here, you've got like giant water bugs or water striders, but... For me, like, where would they come from in my yard? They're not going to just fly in. Um, they need to come from a pond or a creek or something. Uh, but 
I, there is that that to worry about. Yes, there are some. And in other places, like, for instance, Florida, you're going to have a whole lot more creepy crawlies than you would have in, in uh, Washington State. Now, look at that female. Look how full of eggs she is. It's just so sad that I can't give you tides and infusoria and calcium in the form of salt uh, crystal and this one's also all chubby and pregnant so it's just man I wish I could spawn these but it's because they're in a colony that I'm getting this behavior otherwise they just sit on the glass and graze and that's that's fine that maybe that's all you want certain fish for but um, for me, I like to see what they do naturally. I like to see them in their, in their element, you know, in their natural habitat. Um, let's see here. Let's get this light up. Why is it so dim? Uh, these Daniels here, like this is their natural habitat. All these floating leaves and stuff. Um, and there's a, whoa, why is there a guppy in here? I have no idea where the guppy came from. Uh, but in here, we've got a million shrimp again. We've got the hill stream loach. Uh, we've got some bettas. Uh, this little girl. And then the male. Where did he go? Chunky red male. The koi. Um, oh, I put an air stone in there too, by the way. Literally, this tank hasn't had a filter in forever. But I put an air stone in there because I fed them um, blood worms and there was a protein film on everything. So I just wanted to get rid of it. So the air stone is just there to break up the... Um, it's just one of those zis, zis or zis never clog ones right below the surface. And it's just there to kind of help break that up. Because um, otherwise duckweed sometimes it just turns into this algae layer, which in a way can be nice because sometimes if you blast it with light, you can get the duckweed to grow algae underneath it and the protein skim layer. And then you literally can just peel it off and get rid of it that way. Oh, there's the big koi. Betta. Big bruiser. Um, Alex, wanting to keep a large school of nano fish... Um, and a single angel fish as a centerpiece. Any advice? Um, you can do that, uh, if you have space. And again, I've said this a lot of times in streams, but give the little fish enough numbers that they feel safe or they're not ever going near that angel fish. There's a good chance also, by the way, that that angel fish will hunt down anything that fits in its mouth. Um, especially if it's a lone, like this lone angelfish, she gets bored because her buddies died and now she will just snap. So she needs a territory. So angelfish are cichlids and you want to give them a territory. They like to spawn on vertical surfaces. So sometimes you can even just take like a dowel and put moss around it or get some manzanita or wood of whatever kind, put that in the tank. Um, and they'll, they'll want to kind of weave through that discus like those vertical, basically flooded forests. And then you want enough, whether it's plants or rocks or, uh, decor swirling around or, I don't know, artificial pipes, whatever. Um, then you want the school to be able to weave around that and stay away from the angelfish. Um, I'm glad that you're going with an angelfish over a garami or something. Um, though garamis tend to be mean. If you did do a garami, I would do the powder blue dwarf garami. Um, you could also do a crib or something like that, I suppose. Um, but, you know, an angel's pretty unique and, um, I, I understand why you'd want to do that. Oh, my little wiggly noodles of love and joy. They're like little puppy dogs. I just love gobies and, and loaches. Um, oh, you have giant water bugs that fly? We don't have those here, so I guess we lucked out. Um, I would say to have a colony of stiphodons, I've noticed the behavior right around 9, 8, or eight to 10 
is where they start acting like this with, and they don't need to be the same species. They just need to be the same style. And most stiphodons are all kind of the same length. They all kind of have the um, horizontal stripes other than like this one has some uh, vertical stripes. Um, but they all kind of just chill together and dog pile on and do these little cute uh, aerobics. That's the same species, and that's a female and a male together. Um, and there comes another female. So there's a good chance that with that male showing off that red there, the birdsong goby, that um, they're actually wanting to mate. These guys mate a lot, and you'll all you'll see is a little puff of um, cloudy water, and that's it. And like I said, they're single cell, um, single cell sized they're the size of sperm human sperm so um not to get too graphic but in a single session a male will produce a hundred million of them that that exit the body well um that gives you an idea of the size maybe um in a in a say a tablespoon of volume or something so um yeah, they're very small cells. They're the smallest cells in our body, and these fish have cells around the same size. This female, you can see the red on the tail, and she's just digging around looking for food. Um, but yeah, I, I love this tank, um, the Papua New Guinea tank, slash Pacific Islands tank, where we've got the, the thread fins from Papua New Guinea and all these. These guys are, all the stiphodons get along well interchangeably in colonies because they are from... Des disparate, not desperate, islands um, all around the, the the Pacific. Some are, you know, thousands of miles apart. And they come together, and they've kind of all evolved to fill the same niche. Um, but it's just important to, when, when, when keeping fish, even if you can't get enough to make it resemble a natural habitat or colony size because i mean these could be you could have a thousand in a river right but in your two square feet of tank um you don't want the density that would be in a natural river necessarily just because your tank won't support that unless you do water changes like twice a day you know um or a constant water change like a water um line system in there uh Let's see here. Right on, David. That's cool. Yeah, if, if yours are already active, you can get more. Um, and they'll probably just get more and more active. Um, Epic Dignute says, I love Aquatic Arts poster in the background. Love looking through their website. They have so many cool offers. I, I Animals I wouldn't know about otherwise. Yeah, right now they've got really good shrimp killer native fish coming in and they're going to start carrying discus soon which makes me think i might need to get a discus tank set up i don't know using bamboo instead of dowels is much better i would that's probably a way better idea uh, honestly uh, emily good thinking i just was talking off the top of my head um where do i get grendel worms and elisoma so grendel worms are um you know i i would look probably on Aquabid or contact local clubs like contact and pay the 10 to 20 bucks um, to join a mailing list um, there's also a Facebook group called uh, live what is it live food or live uh, live uh, gosh what is it called live fish food or, or I don't know there's there's a group that's relatively new on Facebook but they've got a whole group of people that are are in theory you're not supposed to buy or sell living things but you can meet people that are in a group called um, live feeding aqu or aquarium live feeders or something like that so you can make a guess as to um, maybe messaging them personally like the active posters might help you out um but that can be a bit of a a uh, chore so uh good to see you kenny good to see you pete 
Um, let's see, where are we at? I'm at the bottom. I literally got to the bottom. All right. So, in here, uh, we've got the the other Mormorid, the little littler one. Uh, looking good. I'm going to probably start the acclimating process soon. Um, I hope they do okay in this tank. There are quite a few Aspidoras, Corridoras in here. But other than that, really, there's just some teeny tiny... I mean, they don't even... The little Gilbert eyes, Pseudomagil Gilbert eyes, they don't even make... A, they, their biomass is, like, negligible, the amount of poop and stuff they make. So, really, it's just this this grouping of about 10 quarries and a 40 breeder. Um, so, I'm not too worried about it. I think, I think I'll probably put some more rocks in over here so that both can have a territory. But then again, these two Mormorids were in the same tank at the uh, fish store, and they were getting along, and they were in the same little hidey hole. So um, I, hopefully they'll continue to get along, I, I hope. It could be, though, that they were crammed in there, um, and that's why they were getting along, just because they kind of had to. I hope that's not the case, but it could be. Um, let's see... Oh, the last thing I wanted to mention, too, is that um, on my page, in the description, if you're someone who wants to support this channel, but, you know, you support other channels, or you're doing your own channel, or, you know, you're out of work, or it's been a tough year, you know, I get it. There's a million, there are a million reasons why you may not have uh, money to super chat or whatever, but if you do want to try to support the channel, I, I figured out two great ways that you can help me. One, if you're buying anything on Amazon.com, simply go to any of the products I've linked to Amazon in any of my recent videos in the description. If you pull up the Amazon shopping page through those videos, you'll then give my channel credit and I'll get half a percent all the way up to like three percent in some cases i think of the sale so it adds up if everyone does it and it takes nothing away from you or your order it's just they see that you got on to amazon and that you did it by checking out my channel essentially um you don't even need to buy the thing i suggested you could literally want toilet paper and then go click on my um hikari uh uh, carnivore pellets and then once you're on Amazon in your browser the Hikari carnivore pellets just uh, type in the top in the same browser now that it's open uh, drill bit or toilet paper or whatever it is you need and then that will go towards the channel so that's one great way you can help out not just my channel but any youtuber um, if you're someone who uses Amazon. Now the other thing you can do is, and a few people have written me about this, and so I decided to say it yet again. Also, Aquatic Arts, you can get 15% off that from them. Usually they throw in an extra fish or shrimp when you order a group, uh, and usually they try to pick out, you know, the best of what's there, you know, kind of first come, first we get a little bit of special treatment because we're kind of uh, OG like this with aquatic arts. Um, and if there's anything you guys want, they listen also. So you'll notice now that they're plugged into my Facebook group. They're the only fish store that I work with. They don't pay me like, you know, they don't pay me to say stuff or anything like that. Um, but they will give me um, gift cards for giveaways and stuff. And so I like to repay them by, um, you know, highlighting their fish and things like that, doing unboxings. Um, so I wanted to mention that little thing. Um, but that code changes every few months. So just check my most recent videos. And from here out, we'll have the, the newest code. It'll be 15% off. And um, they'll treat you like rock stars. I mean, they will anyways. Great customer service. But just so you know. All right. The last little tidbit the last little piggy uh that went wee 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 all the way home um is that audible audible which is owned by amazon it's a way you can listen to books on tape 
I've had uh, a few people like Donald Wolf. I've had um, Don Kemeno. I've had um, uh, Ben Chester and Jenna Chester. Uh, several uh, good, good uh, longtime viewers and stuff have um, actually gotten aquatic, aquatic arts have gotten Audible uh, the free trial. They've downloaded two free books that they get to keep forever. And, um, you know, anybody worried about data farming and stuff like that, you're on YouTube. Amazon and Google, Facebook, YouTube, they, they all share all that. And they already know everything about you. They already have a profile all worked out about you because of what you're watching. But um, I understand that concern. But I'm just saying um, it's within that group already. So you're not really giving out information to yet another, you know, when people are promoting sites like raid shadow legends or honey or whatever things like that that are on um you thing like honey uh, is a is a website that gives you deals it's a browser attachment but it also watches exactly what you buy pays attention to your gps your text like it's crazy it scrubs all your data and sells that off to companies that then market that and also do you know focus groups and things whereas audible's all in-house for Amazon, so you might get Amazon ads in theory, but I, I I like to really look into anything that I'm saying. Hey, if you want to help out the channel, do this or that. And the Amazon shopping list by clicking on anything on that's linked on my um, description in in any of my videos, uh, and then getting to Amazon's shopping page that way. That's the the great way. Free doesn't cost you anything. And it just helps me a few pennies a transaction usually. Um, and then the Audible thing though is they give me three whole dollars. You don't need to do anything um, afterwards. You can cancel that crap and say, I hated it. But if you like it, which I do, I mean, a lot of the books about, you know, ancient Egypt that I was checking out, I'm listening to that or watching other people's YouTube channels that are like history channels or um, linguistic channels, things like that, archeology span channels. And, um, but I'll pop that on and I'll do my water changes. So I really do like Audible. Uh, you know, obviously I like Audible and podcasts and things like that. So um, it is a service that I think is cool. And if you try it out, I get three bucks. So it's basically a $3 super chat. You signing up. And then just set an alarm before 30 days is up and say, X nay, get rid of it, 86 that, I don't want it. You get to keep the two free audio books. Um, but if you did get, then you've got a new way to listen to audio books. And, you know, um, I like the service. I have it. And uh, they obviously they don't pay me or anything either. Um, it's just set up so it's a copy and paste thing. And literally in the description, if you go there, and sign up at for it. You don't need to enter any codes or anything. You just go to the link in the description below and I'll get three bucks for everybody who tries it out for the free trial and six bucks if you actually sign up for it for a month. So um, no pressure on signing up for it, but uh, if you're looking for a way to support me or other creators, um, not just me, those are some really easy ways to basically get money for your attention they're paying you for your attention rather than making me watch ads uh and then they're just forwarding it on to creators rather than giant corporations keeping the difference um which they're still making money too obviously uh but in any case i just wanted to to give those shameless plugs um we're gonna announce all the details of the aquascape in the video and then probably discuss it on tuesday uh, also, we'll have the unboxing of what I'm going to be putting out into um, the full um, ponds and stuff this season uh, out back. And um, I, yeah, you know, that's really it. Uh, thank you for listening to my spiel. You guys, thank you so much. Thank you for the super chat today. That was great. And welcome to the new member who joined during this chat. You know, it's ups and downs. And right now, it, my channel is, is not getting recommended very much. I've done a lot of pretty nerdy um, content lately uh, if you look through my non live stream stuff and so if you like that content that's real nerdy 
um, do me a favor and, and go back and watch some of the ones you missed or, or recommend them to a friend. Just send the link to a friend and that means worlds to me. But thank you so much. I'm tooting my own horn. We should have Joey from uh, King of DIY and we'll be talking about the history of you know, the first people on the internet doing Aquabid and all that kind of stuff. And it should be really interesting. Like a lot of people, like especially Gen X and younger, they forget. It's easy to forget at my age too. You know, in my 30s now, it's easy to forget before the internet how hard it was to get a hold of rare fish and whatnot. In some ways, the community was more tight-knit, but way harder to access. And uh, yeah, so... I'm going to get out of here, but you guys, thank you for spending this time with me and uh, for all the support, all you do, all the great questions. If I didn't get a question, leave it uh, after the video in the comments and I'll make sure to come back and get them. Uh, and if I miss it for some other reason, just yell at me. Also, we should have some more great giveaways that we'll be doing. Um, you know, more, we got the $250 and the $100 and the $50 gift cards. Uh, and I'm pulling for the moderators. So we'll, we're going to try to get something going for them from Aquatic Arts too. Uh, so that's why I wanted to give these spiels and kind of uh, they, I'll scratch their back, uh, and hopefully they'll scratch mine and yours, and we can all have uh, itchy free backs. All right, guys, thanks for chatting. Have a wonderful rest of your weekend, and um, yeah, hit that like button on your way out if you forgot if you forgot to do that so far. And make sure you're subscribed. A lot of people have been telling me uh, I'm not subscribed, and I've been seeing the numbers just do do do. You know, the channel's obviously growing, but uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> I don't know why YouTube does that, but just make sure that stuff's set up or that your alerts are on if you want to hear it from me. If you don't, then turn them off, because I'm a lot to handle sometimes. All right, you guys, I'm going to shut up for real this time. Thanks for joining me. Get that sunshine. Take care of your fish. Get excited about life. Learn something new. Teach someone something new. Take care of your little fishies and your plants. And, of course, take care of yourself, because you can't take care of those around you and the things you love unless you take care of yourself and love yourself first. So, um, yeah, I think if we all do those things, we'll have a better world tomorrow uh, and feel better about things today. So uh, go out and get it, guys. Seize the day. I'll talk to you later. Uh, have a good one. Good night.